from school. She expects him home around 430. However, she says he's been getting home as late as six o'clock at night. If there's anything that's going on in the evening times after school, everything has to be pushed back. Wallace says it's not only an after school issue. She says kids are also arriving to school almost an hour after class has started. I'm a bit stickler with my son on academics and grades. And if he's not there, uh, I have I know certain teachers say they're going over a study guide for a test maybe the next day. And if my son doesn't get that valuable time with that teacher, just like the other kids, he's missing out. This is the bus stop where Wallace's son gets off at every day. The mother of two says she's tried being patient with the Henry County School District, but that they keep shifting the blame onto the transportation department. But it's an issue now and you know it needs to be corrected. According to a district spokesperson, the bus disruptions are not a district wide problem. He says the issues at Hampton Middle were due to key bus drivers being absent the last two weeks. The district has since hired an additional driver with the hope of on time arrivals returning to normal. In Hampton, Zach Summers, Atlanta News First. All right, so we'll be staying on top of that story for you and see if that situation, um, you know, resolves itself. Here's one thing that has been resolved. You remember the story that we told you about the, the dog that disappeared at Atlanta's airport at Hartsville Jackson. This dog, the woman was on her way to, to the Dominican Republic and uh, the dog escaped its kennel at Delta Airlines. And for three weeks, that woman has not known where her dog was. Guess what? It's been found and it's on his way back home to its mom. Our Madeline Montgomery was at the airport this morning and has the latest on this. This really just feels personal to me. I've been talking to Paula Rodriguez since Maya was lost. She calls Maya her hija or daughter in Spanish. And it was three weeks of no sightings of Maya and she was finally found healthy right here on airport grounds. We have a photo of her right after she was found and Maya was traveling with her owner from the Dominican Republic through Hartsville Jackson when Rodriguez found out she did not have the paperwork to get to her final destination in California and she had to return home. And in that time, Delta took Maya, who then escaped from her kennel shortly after getting into their custody. Rodriguez ended up getting into contact with a pet recovery specialist, Robin Allgood, out of Fayette County, who put up flyers for Maya all over nearby the airport. A FedEx employee spotted the flyers and then spotted Maya at the airport. Allgood was able to search for the dog with airport workers and a wildlife specialist, eventually finding her near the North Cargo facilities. Scooting! And I got up to her and she still hadn't turned around and, and looked at me. And so I just took a deep breath and I thought, you know what? It's now or never. And I just reached up with both hands and just grabbed around her waist and she just relaxed into my hands. And I had her. I do have her. I have her. I have her. In a statement from Delta, they say they are glad for the teamwork that made this all possible. And All Good says that Maya was checked out of the vet to make sure she is good to go home today with her own Apella Rodriguez's mother. Reporting at Hartsville Jackson, Atlanta International Airport, I'm Madeline Montgomery, Atlanta News First. Now that's the kind of story, those are the kind of stories we like to bring you, right? Because we bring you so much bad news all the time. Um, you know, when we first started at 11 o'clock here on Atlanta News First Plus, I said today, September 11th. And whenever you say that, everybody automatically remembers the terror attacks of that day. Can you believe it's been 22 years since the attacks in New York and then um, in Arlington, right across the river from Washington, D.C. on our Pentagon? Everybody remembers where they were, right? Alan Jackson's song that says, you know, you remember where you were the day the world stopped turning, right? Um, Let's show you some of the memorials that were taking place earlier today in New York and in uh, Washington, D.C. There you go. That's a look right there at, um, at New York City, right? That's where the names of all of those victims were read out loud. There was a moment of silence at 9.03. That's when the first plane hit the South Tower, exactly 9.03. Look at that, people people just probably just remembering the people who were lost, so many firefighters, first responders. It looks like they're etching their names right from that memorial onto a piece of paper. Every year, I can't imagine how difficult it is for the family members to go through this. There are still um, 
it's more than a thousand people who have not been identified, whose remains have not been identified from that particular day in New York City. And at the Pentagon uh, in Arlington, right across the river from Washington, D.C., the American flag was unfurled just as it was that day on September 11th, 2001. And there were ceremonies there as well. President Biden will address what happened um, all those years ago when he was a U.S. senator, actually. He's going to be making remarks from Anchorage, Alaska. He's on his way back from the G20 summit in India. So he'll, he's actually the first president who was not going to make remarks on September 11th at one of the sites of the attacks, Shanksville, Pennsylvania, uh, the Pentagon, or the Twin Towers in New York. So that'll be kind of interesting as well. Uh, he was a U.S. senator back then. He was on a tra uh, train coming from Delaware back to the Capitol when the attack happened. His wife, Dr. Jill Biden, she says she recalls that day. She said she was terrified not only for him, but for her sister, who was a flight attendant who was living in Pennsylvania at the time. And she says when she was finally able to get a hold of her, she couldn't imagine the, the relief that she had. Again, the ceremonies taking place in New York and um, in Arlington at the Pentagon. That's New York again. I want to come back here because I was in Washington, D.C. at the time of the attacks. Um, I remember sitting and watching television that morning because I was working evenings then. And it was just a glorious day and watching what was unfolding and not realizing what had happened like so many people until that second plane hit and then rushing to work. I want to bring in my colleague Rick Fulbaum because Rick was actually um, Rick was actually in New York at Ground Zero when the attacks happened. So he was actually covering that story uh, for a, a network at the time. Uh, let me see if I can bear with me just a second, see if I can bring Rick in here. There he Ooh, is. You did it. I did it, Rick. Nice um, job, Revere. Hey, September 11th happens every year, and I know those memories come flooding back to you, don't they? Yeah, I mean, how could they not? Right. Uh, it, you know, everybody remembers where they were, and I happen to have been right in the thick of it, mm -hmm. um, working in New York City at the time, um, the initial call was that there was a, uh, a small plane that had struck one of the towers of the World Trade Center. Right. And uh, my assignment desk, uh, those are the folks back at the station that sort of give us our instructions. Mm -hmm. uh, they said, we want you to go down there and check it out. You know, it's- Not an, knowing what was going on at the time, right? I mean, everybody thought it was, first they thought it was a small plane. Right. And they figured it was an accident. Yes. Um, I mean, nobody could conceive the, uh, of, of anything you know, uh, nefarious at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then they told us to sort of hang out for two minutes because they were sending uh, a, a sound engineer, someone to go with us. Okay. Um, and so while we were sitting in our vehicle, in our truck, um, the second plane struck the second tower. How close were you, Rick? Well, when the, when the towers were struck, I was in Times Square. Okay. Um, which is in Midtown Manhattan, mm -hmm. and this was all happening in Lower Manhattan, right? Uh, about a mile and a half south of where uh, I was. At could that you point. could like could you see the smoke and could yeah. you? Yeah, I you, mean, okay. The, tw the twin towers were so tall, right? That you could really see them from <laughs> most parts of New York City, right. no matter what neighborhood you were in. Uh, and once we got in our truck and started heading down the West Side Highway, we actually got behind um, fire trucks that were also heading down mm -hmm. there. Um, it, it, it didn't take long for us to see the two towers, both of which at that point were uh, burning and there was thick black smoke just pouring from uh, the impact uh, area where the planes actually struck the buildings. Can you talk about um, the chaos? Yeah. What was it like? I mean, <clears throat> d because I would imagine at some point were, they, were authorities trying to keep people away from that area? At that point, maybe they just didn't know. There was uh, so much chaos that uh, even, the, the fu even the firefighters uh -huh. who would eventually go into the buildings uh, they didn't know what their instructions were. Right. I, you know, we, we, once the fire trucks pulled over, I told my photographer who was driving our truck, I said, pull over here too. Mm -hmm. We were a block and a half north 
of the North Tower. So we were very close at that point. Right. Uh, and we got out and immediately I grabbed the microphone and uh, started interviewing firefighters who right. were walking towards the, the Twin wow. Towers. And there were, I mean, that, you know, that's what, that's what gets you, doesn't it? That they yeah. were actually going into the they danger. They were going in. Well, but everybody was coming outside. I right. mean, it was, it was I, I think that everyone was in such a state of shock um, and there was a school right right next door, mm -hmm. uh, and I remember all of the students from the school pouring out into the uh, yard right right in front of the building. There were a lot of uh, office buildings and residential um, buildings. Right. Uh, there was a college that was right there on the West Side Highway, and everyone just funneled out onto the highway to to look up, and that's what we were all doing. What, were you there when the towers actually collapsed? Yes, so we were wow. there, we were, everyone was trying to figure out how they were gonna put the fires out. I mean, right. that, that, was, that was the main concern, was how are they going to get water mm -hmm. onto those flames? Because these were, the, 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 the impact zones were in the 90, uh, 95th, 96th floors of these gigantic towers. You know, and so yeah. we were standing there when all of a sudden God. the first tower, which was the south one, right. um, began to crumble right. and the debris just literally came like a wave, mm. poured right north up the West Side Highway where so many of us were standing. We turned and ran. Uh, and you may have seen video from that day. A lot of the video that is repeated uh, in coverage of, of the anniversary every mm -hmm. year is video that, that my crew actually captured. Uh, we were there, my photographer put the camera down, um, sort of facing behind him, right. and we ran to try to escape the debris, um, and thankfully my whole crew was okay. You know, I, I mentioned that I was in Washington, D.C. I was not in the middle of something like that, I can tell you that, yeah. that um, my photographer and I ended up at the state cap at the uh, U.S. Capitol, right. and it was gridlock, and it was not chaos. It was an eerie, strange calm. Mm. You know, everybody believes that plane that went down in Shanksville was headed for the U.S. Capitol. Was Capitol. intended to right, go to the Capitol. Right, intended to go there yeah. when it went down. But one of the images that I have often seen, and that so many of us have seen, and if anybody's visited the museum, which is no longer there in Washington D.C., is the image of that. And I, I'm sorry, but it makes me want to cry. Is that person? jumping from that building and it's just a silhouette yeah and i just wonder sometimes if those images still get you uh, uh, yes they do um those were the images that i saw when i closed my eyes um, for months and months and months um, of all of the images that mm -hmm. i saw that day um, the burning buildings, the, right. uh, the, the towers crumbling and falling, um, the, the, the wave of debris um, sort of coming right at us. Uh, it was the, those people who decided that it was a better option to jump yes. than to be burned uh, alive in the building. And at first, we didn't know what we were seeing. You, you were looking up and you, you see these sort of figures. Right. And it took about, uh, you know, a minute or so uh, to, for somebody to say, those are people. Those are people. Those are people. And then, uh, and it still gets me to this day. I know. There were groups of people that jumped together, that held hands and jumped together. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I'm i often asked uh, when I talk to people about my job, mm -hmm. you know, have you ever, have you ever covered a war zone? Uh, and I can say yes, mm -hmm. because I was um, in lower Manhattan right. on the morning of 9-11, and that was a war zone. And you know, the thing is, all those things are the, just the horrific memories. Oh, okay. But the one thing that I will say is, um, at the end of that week and as the you know weeks and even months went on for a while I've never seen so many people more united like you would meet strangers and there was kindness you remember that Rick 
<laughs> I mean, you know, right? this was in New York City, mm -hmm. um, where a lot of times, you know, you come and go, you don't even really know your next door neighbor yes. often. Um, everyone is so sort of focused on where they're heading uh, that there's not a lot of interaction. But you're right, Gravier, that moment uh, brought New Yorkers together, yes. um, and I'm sure this happened in other parts of the country, uh, but all of a sudden, you would start making eye contact yes. with people on the subway, mm -hmm. uh, people walking down the street, where you didn't do that before. Yeah. Suddenly, now you did because you were part of a select, not that you chose this, mm -hmm. but you were part of a select group of people who lived in a town that had been targeted yeah. um, by terrorists. Nothing has been the same since, right? Um, I want to go back to yeah. New York City, where, you know, this is this is what's happening there today. Yeah, as, so this is the reading of the names. Right. You mentioned that. And, and this is something that takes place every year. And it takes hours and hours and hours to get through all the names. Mm -hmm. And it really does hit home just how... Uh, how great this loss was. The fact and so that it's so personal for so many people. I mean, we can stand here and talk about thousands of lives being lost, but for every one of those people, they were a husband, a wife, you know, a son, a daughter, a friend. Mm -hmm. and, right? and and you see these two women. Uh, I don't I don't know their their story, but I do know from years past that it was you know the the relatives of the victims who were given the chance to to read right. the list of names, always ending with their relative yes. um, before passing it off to the next group of people reading names. And then, of course, the flag. Right. So this was, um, you know, th this was the flight that uh, went in. I mean, it, you know, the Pentagon, you think of the Pentagon as, you know, sort of this symbol of American strength mm -hmm. and power, which, of course, it is. Um, but that day, uh, it, it, be, it also became a target right. and a plane full of innocent people flying uh, into the Pentagon. Uh, just, just awful. Um, and I remember that day, that day because I had a, uh, a good friend who was actually visiting from Colorado, Rick, and I, we had gone out to dinner the night before. And the next morning, this, he ended up actually, you remember because there was a ground stop. Yeah. There was there were no flights. That's right. Flying anywhere that day, um, he ended up actually renting a car and driving from Washington D.C. all the way back to Colorado. And then I think too, you we saw the Pentagon there. Let's just go back to it one more time. Um, uh, I interviewed uh, Thomas Heidenberger, Tom Heidenberger, who was a pilot for United Airlines, and his wife, Michelle, was yep. a senior flight attendant. Mm. They had been married 28 years. She was a senior flight attendant on American Airlines Flight 77 that hit the Pentagon. So I always think of him on this day as well. I think of so many families, um, you know, right. after having reported on 9-11 in, in, the, in the midst of all of it, mm -hmm. every year my assignment would be to cover the, uh, the anniversary. Right. Um, and so there were a number of families of firefighters. I think of the family of uh, firefighter Dowdell, um, who, uh, who died that day, mm -hmm. uh, and his two sons, uh, one of whom followed in his father's footsteps and later went on to become a New York City firefighter as well. Uh, the sacrifice, you right. know, these are, you know, these are these were men and women who signed up for the job of being a first responder, being mm -hmm. a firefighter. Obviously, they knew that there was danger, sort of inherent in that right. in that role. Always the possibility of confronting something, mm -hmm. um, you know, where their lives could be on the line. Mm -hmm. uh, but something th that magnitude. Right. Uh, and for those firefighters to have walked into the buildings um, as everyone was getting was getting was out, running, running out, I mean the the level of uh, bravery and courageousness. I mean it, it it inspires me to this day. Yeah, Rick, thank you for taking time to reflect on that. You know, sure. with us today, it's um, it's an important day. Right? It is. For all of us to remember and it not is. forget and to share with our young people who certainly may not even have been born. Thank you. I appreciate that. My pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Okay. So let's see if I can go back to me.
There we go. There you go. Okay. They're good. Uh, Rick mentioned the firefighters. There are events taking place today all across Atlanta. Uh, there are firefighters who are running stairs in memory of their comrades who lost their lives that particular day. And by the way, if you are interested in um, watching some of the ob observances of what happened on 9-11 taking place in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, at the Pentagon, across the river in Arlington, and in New York City. You can do that just by logging on to atlantanewsfirst.com. We hope you make it a great day today. Hug your neighbor, right? Be kind today and every day. Thanks. We'll see you later.